go live. I now. think fear plays an important part. In all right, let's have a word of prayer. Let's get started. Dear Father in heaven, thank you, Lord, for everyone gathered here. The prayer requests have all been for family, children, grandkids, people that are close to our hearts, Lord, and and those are the hardest people to reach. Those are the hardest people to convince, um, Lord. But we're going to have to realize that only you can convince. Just like uh, in our own lives, Lord, we may have had people trying to tell us, but it wasn't until um, you pulled us out of the uh, the thinking. You pulled us into a relationship with you. So we're just asking that you would do that with everybody that we care about. That we feel like these are desperate times, important times, not the time to be living in a lie or, or a delusion or a self-manufactured narrative. But this is a time, Lord, in which we have to know you who is the truth. So I pray, dear God, that you will send the Holy Spirit out to every single questioning and wondering heart. Everybody who was just uh honest in their spirit lord but they're confused or they're just um deceived i pray dear god that you will send the holy spirit out with the angels and lay a hold of souls that don't know how to find you how to get to the truth how to make their way back home so i just pray lord for the holy spirit to be in the world striving upon hearts that the holy spirit is in our lives in this room with us individually and personally in this room while we study, but also with us as we go our ways. I really pray, Lord, for the promise of your fellowship. I pray that you'll teach us to be in fellowship with you, teach us how to be face to face with you, how to wrestle with you, how to really um, lay a hold of our dependence upon you uh, and to not presume, but to really depend upon you, to really have genuine faith. So I just ask for the promise of the Holy Spirit the only agent, the only person that can bring us into a real saving faith and relationship and trust with you is the Holy Spirit. And we ask for him to be here now as we open your word and search to know the hidden manna, the great white stone, uh, so that we may know our um, citizenship, our sonship, being a daughter, being a child of the king. So help us to see, help us to understand and give us your wisdom now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. All right, guys. Well, let's go right to the book of Revelation chapter 2. And let's look at verse 12. Is the be live connecting good? No, I didn't. I didn't go through it. So it's just on uh, YouTube. Okay. Okay, yeah. Maybe that one's good for this one then. Yeah, that's what, that's what I thought. Okay. Because not everyone has to see all of them. Because we're going to have a lot of like kind of talking discussion. I have so many verses that if if we sat there did the verses, we here for nineteen hours only reading verses. But I think we're just going to have to kind of get into some discussion, which is great. I, I don't want to uh, overwhelm everyone just verses, but we're going to go there. Let's go to Revelation chapter two. We'll start with verse twelve, and then we're going to read all the way down to verse seventeen. Who would like to read? Paige, the reader. And to the angel of the church in Pergamos write, These things says he who has a sharp two-edged sword. I know your works and where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast to my name, and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which hold which thing I hate. Repent, or else I will come to you quickly, and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And then this part she's going to read is the study today. Go ahead. To him who overcomes, I will give some of the hidden mana to eat. And I will give him a white stone, and on the stone a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Beautiful. Good reading. And then just as a little bit of the background thing, the Nicolaitans, there's very few things that God says, I hate. Yeah, that's... And the Nicolaitans in our past study were the hierarchy system of the ecclesiastical order. 
And it's the priest class versus the laity. And it says, God says, I hate that. You're all, quote, sheep and I'm the shepherd. <laughs> What's this whole, you know, hierarchy kind of a thing where you have all the politics of it and all the power kind of uh, monopoly that's going on in church? God hates it, right? And then, of course, we look at how that's in the church. Yeah, that's that's in both uh, Protestant and in the papal system. Papal systems the is the marquee, you know, the the, the gold standard of the Nicolaitan. Really? And then we have a wonderful apostate Protestantism that's doing the same thing in these last days. But what's fascinating, to him who overcomes, mm -hmm. that's a key thing here, I will give some of the hidden manna to eat, and I will give him a white stone, right? And all that stone, a new name written, which no one knows except him who receives it. Go to Revelation 19, verses 7 and 8. I want you, well, I don't want to be too, let's see here. Yeah, well, actually, what I want you to do is go to verse 12. Just go to Revelation 19, 12. And the reason why I'm skipping over a bunch of stuff is I don't want to be overwhelming with scripture but the if you'll notice if you just read revelation 19 just as a kind of a comment yeah. notice white horse made fine clean and white 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 you're gonna see that just just and it's a war motif and it's a woman a bride making herself white and ready and you're gonna see she goes through trial and purification she's tested and she's made white and he comes in on a white horse and it's like being birthed out it's like this white kind of birthing process that's going on. It's kind of fascinating. It's, that's the theme. And you'll see that all throughout scripture is this idea of being brought through trial and this whiteness comes popping out from it. But check out, look at and read verse 12. Check out the language on that. Who wants to read? His eyes were like a flame of fire and on his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. So what's this whole name no one knew except you know the name? A name, a new name, a white stone. And you'll see that what's interesting, like when the children, when God's people were in Egypt, back to our Egypt theme, it says that uh, God tells Moses, they know me as El Shaddai, but I'm going to show them that I am Yahweh. Now we're thinking, oh, this is super deep esoteric Hebrew. No, 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 it's simple. Don't make something mysterious when it's simple. The word El Shaddai is like a mother with large breasts. It's feminine. It's I'm, I'm nursing them, but I'm going to wean them off. And though Yahweh is, I am that I am. I'm going to show myself to be Yahweh provider. Or we say Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh. Yahweh Yira. What is that? I'm going to provide for them. As a hidden one, he's going to hide in the clouds. He says, he's going to hide in the rock. He's going to be hidden, but he's going to provide in the wilderness. Hidden provision in the wilderness, starting off with manna. This is interesting. And you'll see this. And he's testing them and trying them and putting them out into the wilderness to know something deeper about God. They know me like your children, right? They know you as mom and dad. Mom, dad. But then when they have their own kids, right? When they go through their own trials, when they have their own life experiences, they start relating to you not just as mom and dad. And it's it's a more, oh, oh, I see. Yeah, it's not as easy as I thought. <laughs> wow. Wow. Now I see what you guys went through. I'm so sorry. I was so selfish. I'm embarrassed. That's what happens, right? That's Yahweh. If you start yoking up with God and you start going through your own hardships, all of a sudden you're learning stuff you never thought you'd learn. You thought you knew everything when you were a kid, right? All kids know everything. Did you know that? Yeah. I worked with teenagers. They know everything. Mm -hmm. When you're 14, that's when you finally figured out everything. Yeah. How many times I've gone back to my mom and said, you were right, man. <laughs> yeah, that's Yahweh. And that's what God's doing to his people. God, I'm wrong. You are right. I was being a selfish little child. I didn't understand the wake of destruction that I created. The chill of Israel out in the wilderness doing one of two things, either becoming bitter because they want the breast. 
Ever seen a, have you ever heard of weaning a child? You know what that's like? Man, it's horrible. Child just wants that milk, right? And you're trying to feed it like, you know, smashed up yams. <laughs> she faced on that kid like, what's, what's this face? <laughs> the devil face. Then you've got sweet potato all over his face and he's pushing stuff. No. What's his first words? No. <laughs> right. But what's interesting is actually, no, what are really a child's first words? Mama. Mama. Ah, you know where I'm going. The word manna. Ma. 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 Ah, it's calling my name. No, no, it's da. I heard da. Ma. Da. <laughs> right? The, the very beginning of language. The word ma is where you get manna from. And it means... Right? This number's 11. What is it? It's seeking. My, I have a book coming in the mail. My first book ever is called What's Going On Here. I found it on Amazon. I've, been, I've had whole sermons called What's Going On Here. Talked about this book I had as a kid. I found it. So it'll be here on the 14th. I'm so excited. And it's the book. And it's, first of all, you see someone close, you can't figure it out. What? And then the, he says, blah, blah, look, there's a pig snout and a handle to a water faucet. What's going on here? Ma. The word ma is what? You know what it means. What? What? Who? Why? When? Anytime you're in the Hebrew and it's saying, you're asking a question. How long? When? For what reason? Ma. How is this working? Ma. 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 Kind of sounds like a sheep. Yeah, you're 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 getting ahead of the game here. Yeah, God's a shepherd; He's leading His sheep, and we are in want, right? Psalms what twenty three? The Lord is my shepherd. We we think I shall not want. I don't want Him as my shepherd. That's what we think it means. <laughs> but what does it really mean? God is my shepherd. I shall not. Come on, you're you can be Hebrew students at this point. I what? Want. Yeah, I shall I not want. want things because he's already given it to me. He's given me the hidden manna. See, we are motivated by things that are internal, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I've never been validated. My dad never said I love you. Bah! So I become like a corporate madman. And they will all bow to my will. <laughs> 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 so it's this idea of like internal needs that are very profound and deep and people are motivated by this stuff. And God's saying, I know what's inside of you. I know what you're feeding on. I mean, I'm a counselor, right? I do all the psychology. And really, what is my work? To find the hidden manna. What is it that is driving you? How are you sustaining yourself even through hardships? What is it that you're feeding on that gets you through what you get through. Is it good or is it bad? Is it destructive or is it healthy? That is the essence of counseling. If you're good at it. So God is the great counselor. In fact, he calls himself counselor. His name is wonderful. He's a great counselor. And he says, I've got to get you into ma. What is it? What's going on? Why? And you'll see when we go into this, we, I guess we can. Well, let, let me actually. Let's go to Numbers 11 and just let's look at verse 7. So we'll keep it kind of simple. Then we'll do Exodus. Actually, let's go to Exodus. No, let's start with Exodus 16.31. Let's do it that way. Exodus 16.31. So is that why, like, during this, um, the children of Israel cried out for water? And you kept crying. Well, we get into it. He was forcing them to cry out for stuff, right. for water, for, for food, for protection. Yeah. Now, yeah. now I see. I just, yeah, he was forcing them to recognize their need because at first he let them have three days supply. Do you know that? that everyone was allowed to have a three day supply. So after three days, they kind of ran out. You know, everyone brought granola bars with them. <laughs> You know, they pack their stuff. It's like, ever, yeah, you ever seen the movie Stand By Me? And the kids want to go see the dead body. 
I don't know if you saw the movie, but anyway, it's it's a story right of oh these kids are on this little adventure and they only had like they only brought a couple of things. I remember I went backpacking one time and I thought everyone's going to bring like I, I I said hey you bring this you bring this you bring this I was the only person who brought anything, so I brought I you know because we're going to have hot dogs and we're going to have this 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 so I assigned everybody something I was the only person who brought so I brought granola bars hot dog buns and cans of peaches that's it and we were out there for a week and we were living and what's so interesting is when we're sleeping everyone's all moaning and complaining to me I'll be able to brought anything they're oh, well, why did well, you know I'm a flake well, I'm supposed to make up for the flake factor you know I'm a flake you know I'm a flaky dude all right. Well, they were mad at me because I only brought hot yeah. dog buns and peaches and dry granola bars. And I was to blame. Well, we're out there living on hot dog buns and uh, peaches and, uh, and dry granola bars. And I remember in the middle of the night, I'm hearing this sound around us. Everyone else is just trying to deal with the grumbly, the rumbly and the tumbly. And so they all had Walkmans, right? So you hear the, you know how someone's wearing their little Walkmans, you can kind of hear it a little bit. So I hear three other Walkmans going off and they're there just trying to deal with their hunger. And uh, I didn't bring Walkman. I didn't have anything. And I'm hearing crunch, crunch. <laughs> oh, what in the world? For your food. And they're all like laying there listening to Fog Hat Live and Aerosmith. <laughs> I'm a fool for the city. Uh -huh. I know that. <laughs> I know that you know that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, everyone's just jamming out their tunes, listening to Ronnie Montrose and whatever. <laughs> this is all 70s throwback, oh, man. He's enjoying that. That's all right. That's too good. But anyway, that's true. That's the actual what they're listening to. And I'm the only person hearing this soft crunch. What in the world? I'm getting all paranoid. Finally, like, I'm just like, wake up, everybody. Wake up. They're like, go back to, like, dude, like, everything's fine. Yeah. And they're uh, going back to their Walkmans. So anyway, I'm like, quietly listening. And what happens is, at one point, I grab a flashlight, and I... To, to try to look out and right there were two uh, mountain lions. Oh, uh, even worse. Like close, 15 feet away. I'm like, get up, get up, get up, get up, get up. Get up. Get up, use. <laughs> use guys. Use guys. <laughs> up, use guys. And they were, I'm like, mountain lions, mountain lions. I'm freaking out, right? They're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> we're freaking out, man. And I'm the one, I jump for the fire and I start to stoke up the fire. And so they were circling us. They didn't run. They kept circling. Waiting for somebody. They're hunting. They're hunting. <laughs> Interesting things when you get people and animals hunger in the wilderness. You get into a different state of mind. And so we're out there hungry. They're out there hungry. And so God has a way of bringing you out to the wilderness where you start seeing the nature of things, don't you? Right? Yeah. All right. Willing to sacrifice your hot dog bun. No, I wasn't willing to sacrifice. Hot. We're hungry. That's what I mean. That was actually the point. You think these guys are going to give up those hot dog buns to a couple mountain lions? It's amazing how there's something inside of you saying, I will die over these hot dog buns. I don't know how dry they are. I'm sitting with your hot dog bun just going, oh, we fight to the death now. So on that note, let's go to Exodus 16, verse 31. Verse 31. Okay. Yeah. In fact, hold on. Let me uh, let me plug this in because my laptop's about to die. Sixteen thirty-one. So, what does Exodus sixteen thirty-one say? And the house of Israel called its name Manna, and it was like white coriander seed, 
and the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Now, what's interesting, honey is something that they used to use. It's the word where we get Hanukkah from, Hanuk, yes, okay. right? It's to dedicate. You anoint the lips with honey as an incentive. You got something right. You got something right. You learned your lesson. You know, God has a way of incentivizing you for taking a step. And that's what manna did, right? When they were dropping off the manna, it's so they would move through the desert. A lot of times we're just like, no, I'm staying here. I'm not going anywhere. And like the manna goes rotten, right? All of a sudden it's not so great. And God has a way of moving us through life by saying, no, no, you took some steps. The manna's over there. And even the coriander, you're thinking. And as I said, I could give you all the notes for this afterwards just to kind of keep it in discussion mode is the word coriander it's only used here and in Numbers 11.7. Go to Numbers 11.7. We'll touch on it. So it's coriander, white, the taste of wafers made with honey. It's a hanak. It's to get you to keep taking those steps. It's a discovery process. It's leading you on. It's the movie E.T. with Reese's Pieces, right? Remember how we incentivized the alien to come into the house? So Numbers 11.7, it's saying the same thing, but it's saying it in Numbers 11.7. Who would like to read that? Go ahead. No, just, just verse 7. Oh. And when the assembly is to be gathered together. Wait, is this Numbers 11? Okay, that's okay. That's okay. 11.7. Got it? Yeah. Chapter yeah, chapter eleven, verse seven, numbers. And but P.S. real quick on eleven, numbers. Eleven, eleven, seven. eleven seven. seven. No, he's thinking about seven eleven. We're all green. Yeah. Yeah. It's like right here. There's a circle around this cake. Yeah. Is this a flying J? Yeah. <laughs> so no real quick before i say anything what, the book of numbers is really the picture of the children of israel were being numbered according to the order in which god was leading them out in the wilderness and god was quote numbering them is that interesting remember when king david numbered uh, god's people and god says don't number them but there's a book of numbers so what's these numbers? It's not just numbers. A lot of people think, oh, it's just a bunch of numbers or something. No, no. Numbering is when God is leading you somewhere, there's a certain order, right? Even like the feast, you have this idea of a, uh, the, the word even is the idea to order something. When God leads you out, he places things in order. When he's leading you out in the wilderness, he orders things. What was once chaos is now in order. Is that interesting? Mm -hmm. The book of numbers is how God cleansed and numbered them, ordered them. And they, through the wilderness experience, went through a, uh, an ordering. A uh, They went from a chaos to an order. And God cleansed them as they went through the wilderness. And the book of Numbers is this cleansing process. And the manna part is one of the biggest parts of Numbers. They're really focused. In fact, if you really want to study manna, you're going to study all of chapter 11. In fact, it's going to play back again into chapter 21 and it's a big part of the whole what pergamon is talking about here in the book of revelation it's balaam it's the story of balaam's in there manna is in there all of this stuff is in numbers that pergamus is talking about and it's the idea of how does god lead his people out to the wilderness incentivize them to go but it's getting them deeper and deeper and deeper to parse about themselves that they're having a hard time seeing and wanting to deal with and in fact when you go to the sweet honey wafer thing, they go to the waters called Meribah, the waters of bitterness. Remember, we're talking about bitterness. God lets things happen in your life and your choice. The first thing you meet up with is bitterness and the waters will be made sweet. Right. If you trust God, he'll sweeten the waters. But he always brings you to your hunger first, to your thirst and to bitterness first. That's, that's exactly what's in the first place they came to was the. The bitter uh, mirabah, it's called, and then later on to the 70, 70 palms, right? It's actually fresh water, exactly. And so, then ultimately says, I'm gonna lead you to a place where you're not gonna need this. That's also in the book of Numbers. You're not gonna need any of this later when you're in the quote promised land in heaven. 
when you're face to face with me, you're not going to need this. But right now, it's doing a certain thing that's going to prepare you character wise to come into the promised land. Because guess what? When God brought them into the promised land, they're still in their sinful flesh. He says, you're going to go and worship other gods. Why? Because you don't need me anymore. When you're in a place where you don't need God anymore, you're going to go right back to your old nonsense that got you in bondage in the first place. In fact, you're going to go ahead and straight back to Egypt and saying, there is leeks there, there is garlic, there is marinated meat, there is red snapper, there's watermelon. I'm going back to my slave food. Hmm. It was better back there when I could get predictable food, even though I'm under, quote, the slavery. And in fact, it's real interesting. It says that the way that Pharaoh kept them all there was to increase the workload mm -hmm. and to really embitter them. It's weird how you can become toxically addicted to people that are mistreating you. Is that interesting? Yeah. You can become, and that is, it says that Pharaoh was wise in doing that. Mm -hmm. He took counsel. It says he was wise. Mm -hmm. It's weird how when you abuse people, how they strangely find themselves wanting to please their master. It's like they wanted to be ruled. And in fact, you know, the idea of manna, well, they would call it masa. You ever heard, if you ever go to a Jewish store, you have matzah balls? Yeah. Or matzah. Matzah or masa was the idea of, of God giving you bread during great times of affliction and hardship. And that's what matzah balls are for. Is that interesting? A lot of people don't even know. And in masa is the idea of uh, giving you something when you're in a desperate situation. And then so they they make masa balls for Passover to remind them that God provided in the wilderness. In New York, they called masa ball soup uh, the healing. Like if you were sick, you would have masa ball soup. If you had a cold, you would feel better. Right. In fact, I didn't want to have to do this, but I actually, in this study, have a recipe for masa, masa ball soup. In this study. Wow. I even, yeah, is that crazy? In fact, I'm almost embarrassed. Are you guys ready for it? Not just the recipe, yeah. but uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the matzah. Um, it's uh, texture made of matzah balls can either be light or dense. Interesting. You'll see the whole light affliction, heavy, this type of thing. Watch this. Depending on the recipe, matzo balls made from some recipes either float in soup or sink. It's depending on what they're trying to do, either float or sink. Is this interesting? It says, so the preparation is the matzo balls are dropped into a pulp of salted boiling water. Imagine you being the parable of this. You're dropped in hot water. Man, salting you up. Right. Then the heat turned down to a simmer and then a lid placed upon it and you stew there for a while. So it really gets inside. Then the balls swell during the cooking time. You grow. Some add leaven or baking powder for lightness at Passover. Not advised. Don't add leaven. Some think it's okay to do that. That's the problem. We think adding leaven or adding sin to that process is legit, not legit. This one's for Tony. In 2010, the world's largest matzo ball was prepared. <laughs> In by a chef named John Wordis of Shlomo and Vito's New York City Delicatessen. He created a 426 pound matzo ball what? for the New York Jewish Food Festival. What are you, what are you You're welcome, inside? Tony. That was for you. Thank you. Thank You're you. very welcome. <laughs> anyway, what do you put on the inside? it's just, need, it's really dumplings. You need a big bowl to put that in. <laughs> All right. Numbers 11 7. Numbers 11 7. Go ahead, anybody. Now the manna was like coriander seed, and its color like the color of bdellium. Bdellium. So it says it's white color bdellium. What's interesting, if you want to get into, as I said, I could give you guys the notes for this, but the word bdellium is the word fingernail. It's the color of your fingernail. 
it's white with stripes. It's interesting. The more you get into the study, it's going to be very interesting as you start seeing what's happening here. The word coriander, because they're assuming this is the only two times it's ever used in all of scripture. They assume it's coriander. It's not, it's, it doesn't mean it's coriander. All the word means is to split something, to crack mm -hmm. it open. It, it's something that you break open and it smells fresh. That's all it means. It smells like something that was cracked open. And when you're out there, in fact, the first time it's ever really used is in Genesis 2, where the first river, Pishon, was created. The fountains burst forth, and then it went into four different rivers, right? Mm -hmm. And the smell, it says, was this smell. Mm. It just had freshness. Ah, like you just cracked open like a hot loaf of bread. You go, ooh. You know, you ever had that? Fresh sheets out of the dryer. Mm. Mm. They've been bleached and, you know, there's, you know, just, ah. It had that. Only if you use game. When you get a brand new Bible or a book. Yeah, I always do. I always smell books. I open up and go, ooh, it's why we're addicted to shopping. Brand new smell. Wow, I don't want to wash that. That smells like something new. It's like a new car smell, right? New car. Or, man, you get new clothes. Nothing like Once you wash that out, it's over. I mean, I hate that smell. It smells like, you know, glue to me or something. Yeah, yeah, but for, yeah, it's for preservation. But it's that new, fresh smell. So it's weird how we become shopaholics or we are adventure seeking. We just want to keep smelling. We want to smell the new smell, right? We jump from relationship to relationship because it's new. Does that make sense? Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, you do that. Ah. <sighs> Yeah, I remember like when, when I was a kid hanging out with Larry and Kenny and just that's what it felt like every time we shoplifted. Man. <laughs> they have this new gum called Bubblicious. Soft gum. I'm used to like, you yeah. know, uh, big bubbles. Yeah, I'm used to what's what's the gum? Uh, bazooka. Bazooka. The hard. <laughs> Man, Bubblicious. Because the soft gum was Wrigley's. Juicy fruit, really? You can't blow any bubbles of that stuff. No. Yeah, bazooka, right? There was the other bazooka one, was the Hubba, Bubba. Hubba Bubba. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so but Bubblicious, oh, we're talking by the pocket loads. And then they went to like blueberry. Has the world gone mad? So, yeah, so yeah, we would just eat, blow the biggest bubbles, and it was like. We shoplifted this stuff. This was awesome. Obviously not cool. But it was this weird idea that you just want to be trying the new thing, the new thing, addicted to it. And that's how everything is now. It's Satan's manna. That's Does that make sense? Yeah, that's the first thing when you open the gum. Smelled it first. Yeah, it yeah. So Something new. You go never... to a bakery, man. When I was living in Montana. My favorite stop in the week was this bread shop, man. Ugh. Well, I lived in San Diego when I was in the Navy at Horton Mall in San Diego. They had this new mall called Horton Mall. They in this this uh, cinnamon roll place had this huge blowers going right out oh, in yeah. in the morning where they're making the fresh cinnamon rolls. I mean, literally, my hair and clothes was infused with cinnamon roll smell. I smelled like a giant cinnamon roll. And everybody's walking down the street. Oh, oh just boys. you're just, just Pavlov's dogs. You're drooling. Yeah. Oh, God, I get the cinnamon rolls over at Orton Plaza. This is the manna. It's some new thing, some new trend, right? One we one year the high heels are tall. And it's short heels, high heels, short heels, high heels. Every year, the new thing, recycling of things. Fashion industry is is literally so crazy. You see all these pictures of what is that? What's so new? It's startling. It's Remember when it's the new movie is out. The new album is out. The new release. We were talking about turtlenecks. Yeah. But not the actual whole turtleneck. It was just yeah. like that <laughs> thing that you put on. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We were talking about that. So you put it yeah. shirt yeah. over it. And it just looks like a turtle. So this this idea of coriander seed and then the color of bellium or uh bellium. Yeah, 
or this it's the word here um white or or like flesh color it's it's the idea of you can see through it like it's it's trans it's a white luminescent kind of almost white silvery <laughs> flesh tone seeing through it as i said we won't go through all the heavy duty like studies but it's the idea of um what human beings were created as these translucent beings in which god can show himself through. <laughs> like i was telling zach yesterday or whenever it was about when i was surviving out in the wilderness in the military and we caught a rabbit and we slammed the rabbit's head against the rock heard the yeah had to hit it twice and then we pulled the skin off and it was so weird to see that it had this nail color sheen over it and you saw all the organs in it all still you know what i mean you took his jacket off it looked like a pair of uh you know like uh in the navy we had our what are they called cracker jacks mm -hmm. We had our Cracker Jacks on, and uh, which is your uniform, right? And then you pull the pants and the shirt off, and you see this silvery sheen, and then inside. And that's Joseph's coat of many colors. We were made to display something hidden about God. That from the outside, you can't really tell, but through dependence on God. Through, remember in the garden, what was the main thing about the Garden of Eden that a lot of people miss because it's so much a part of life? Eating. You had to eat to live. That was new. Angels never have to eat to live. You're not sitting there going, man, I'm starving. When are we going to get something from the Lord? They're not sitting here worrying about all that stuff. They don't have toilets in heaven. <laughs> you know? They're, they, that's not what's going on there. They don't have the same, they don't have all these internal organs. We do, right? We have all these internal organs. Why, what in the world? And you notice the words for internal, all the internal organs say something about an internal quality. The word for heart, lep, is what? Right? Your core place in which you make fundamental decisions, how you operate. It is your cardio in Greek, lep. Yeah, it's, it's the very part of what generates your motives, your heart. Like, what is the heart of that person, right? We say it now. Or the kidney is compassion. It's the same word, it's compassion. Where's your compassion? Your guts, yeah, liver is glory, right? It's the idea of what burdens are you willing to bear no matter how toxic or painful it is. You're willing to bear certain burdens, your liver, your glory. You see, leadership was a position of glory. In other words, weighty matters. How do you solve problems? How do you deal with potentially toxic situations? That's what your liver does. Is that correct? That is what, yeah, you measure somebody according to how they solve problems, not create them. Somebody in Washington, the Potomac, hear that? Phil, you are now that guy. Yeah, that <laughs> He's guy. that guy. All right, let's try to hit the volumes on our phones. The old volume. The old volume. <laughs> All right. So, but where do we get the old volume like there's a volume there's enough there's a down the old volume well check this out is the um the word intestines is where we get the word intense intestines intense right what is intestines the word it's tresses believe it or not when jacob he he had this thing called tresses and he stripped some bark and he put the white. And that's the first time you see the word white. He put the white um, uh, branches that were stripped of its bark in these tresses. Do you guys remember that story in Genesis 30? I don't know if you do. But if the animals looked upon it, they got pregnant. Is that, That's a weird story. We could touch on it a little bit. But it was weird. It was something where Laban, where he's in Laban, that's the word white. Is at Laban's house, 
stripping this bark, making it white. These animals are and drinking out of these troughs with these white strip rods or reeds in them. And the animals became pregnant. Now that is symbolic. We're thinking, well, what's the science of that? God's trying to show us something about birthing, white, stripping under great trial, which Jacob was in Laban's house. God purges us through these trials and he strips us. And the word trough is the word intestines. How does God purify? And what is the word intestines? What are you intense about? What courses through your core being, right? Have you ever heard of pathology? <clears throat> or that person's pathetic. The antip, you know, like somebody is, uh, what, what, so what does the word patholic mean? Or pathogen or psychopath? Pathogen that goes through you. It's a path, right? Have <laughs> you ever seen your intestines do this? Yeah. And in the Hebrew, that's how they plowed back and forth, back and <laughs> forth, back and forth. It's how you go to and fro, how you travel through this life. What are you coursing? What is the path? What is Christ says? I'm the way of the truth. You want to know how I think? Watch me. Watch the way I walk. Watch what I do. Watch how I live. I am the way, the truth, the life. That's what he said to his disciples. You want to get to know me? You want to follow the manna? Follow me. I'll show you. I'll, show, I'll reveal myself to you. And in fact, if you want, go to um, Romans chapter 8, verse 28. Famous verse. And in fact, just for fun, we'll let whoever wants to pull up the blue letter type thing. Verse what? Verse 28, 828. So who would like to go to Romans 8, 28? Famous verse. A lot of people know this verse, but it has everything to do with this intestines. How in the world do you travel with God and you learn so much about him? But it's intense. Boy, it really gets down into internal. What, what, what's your intestines used for? Right? Breaking down. Cleansing your body. No, right? What, what's your intestines? Through, through your system and, and your body. Absorb is absorbs through the colon and the intestinal. That's how it gets into the bloodstream, right? Is through all of that. So your your you how you're processing food is through your intestines. How do you process? Are you guys getting a hold of this? Yeah. How do you assimilate? How do you chew? How do you masticate? How do you how do you get a hold of something? How do you consume something? When Christ says. Follow me. You want to know about me? You want to learn about me? You want me to reveal myself? You want me to be a revelation to you? Watch the way I work. Hang out with me. Spend the time with me. You're going to see things that you could have never seen unless you followed me wherever I go. Romans 8, 28 says what? And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to Jesus. Ah, his is supplied, right? Anybody got a King James or anything like that? When it's in parentheses, it's a supplied word. And it's the word, to them that are called according to purpose. Hmm? Purpose? What's my purpose in life? You, you guys want to see the same word uh, in other places? The same word. It's the word, are you ready for this? Prothesis, prosthetics. Prothestomy is the root word, but it's prothesis. It's where we get the word prosthetics from. Now, why pro? I'll never forget a time in which I was ministering out in Greeley, Colorado. And my son was born out there. And that's where I got to really see who I was married to. And the relationship, she had a symbiotic relationship with her mother. They both literally um, had the monthly cycle together. That's how infused they were to each other. Um, mm. Her mother gave her a wedding ring, not because we weren't going to wear one because we're saying we don't want any jewelry. But her mother says, I'll drive out with you, my daughter. And her mother stopped in Iowa and bought her a wedding ring between 
themselves. They were married. That is odd. You think so? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so when our son was born, the mother came out and talked her daughter to moving back to California to live with at home. I came home to an empty house while out in Wyoming doing some ministry for a ranch family. And I came home to an empty house. And, and God was providing heavily. She was, God gave me lots of grace with her too. She was really, I'm thinking, okay, this is pregnancy, this is postpartum, you know, God gave me all this grace. But there's no winning. And um, I came home to an empty house, not even a spoon, fork, cup, knife. The only thing that was there was my books, not even a note. And I call my friend Rick Tryon that I knew in Sweden. And I'm, I don't, I was devastated. I, shame is one thing, but it's just everything. My son, my family, my everything. And all I saw was a few pieces of, not even a lamp, a few pieces of paper on the ground and my books. And I call him up, who I ministered out in Sweden with, who was a pastor for many years. And he says, David, Romans 8, 28. For all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his prothesis. He says, David, there's a commercial out there where all these guys are playing basketball. And it's this really aggressive, heavy basketball game. They're showing from the waist up. And this guy falls down and everyone stops and goes, wow. And then the, the camera pans back. And he's got an artificial leg and he gets back up and gets back in the game. All things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his prosthetics. It's time you get back up. Get into the game. And he says, David, you know what? That, he's giving me a Bible study while I'm on the phone and my life is falling apart in front of me. You would think that it was some canned answer. It was literally like words of gold bars. You then called anyone. Yeah, and I called, I called him. him. And I'm going to let you see how this word is typically translated in the Greek. I want you to go to Matthew chapter 12, verse 4. Zach, you might know this answer, so I'm not going to let you answer. <laughs> I want you to find the word purpose in Matthew 12, 4. And somebody else, well, oh, wait, we'll do this. Then we'll go to Hebrews now. So who would want to read Matthew chapter 12 and verse 4? How he entered the house of God and ate the showbread, which was not lawful for him, nor for those who were with him, but only for the word purpose is in there. Huh? Not lawful? Very good. No? <laughs> but you don't go on to the bonus round sorry all right hebrews so, chapter 9 verse 2 here's the other hint same word it's prothesis yeah showbread okay. hebrews 9 2 go ahead and read that <clears throat> for tabernacle was prepared the first part of which the last the showbread was called the bread of presence. So back to Psalms 23, right? The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not lack anything. Okay, what does he do? What is, what is Psalms 23? We hear it at the funerals and everything else, right? What does this shepherd do? He leads you still waters, right? Green pastures. He anoints your, but what is he? He leads me through the valley. But I fear no evil, right? What does he do in the valley of the shadow of death, it says? He sets up a what? A table in the presence of your enemy. He sets a table in the presence of your enemy in the middle of a war zone. In the hell in my life, he shows up and dines with me. 
Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Answer the door. I want to sit down and dine with you. I want to show you something. No matter how tough it is, invite me and I'll feed you. I'll protect you. And the word for bread in Hebrew is the word lachem, right? Which is the word, same word, bread, lachem. The same word for bread is the same word for war. How is that? It's the idea that, well, that's how God goes to war with your de devils and demons. He shows up and feeds you because really how Satan defeats us, how we don't overcome. Because somebody, we've taken the bread of somebody else, of our fears, of our insecurity. We feed into that. But when we go through the valley of the shadow of death, he says, you invite me and I'll be knocking. Let me in. Remember when the when the when the apostles were hiding for fear of the Jews? Mm -hmm. Jesus says, Let me in. He shows up and he and he eats with them. Remember the road to Emmaus, two guys, they find him. He spreads his hands and says, Wait, the Messiah. Peter failed Christ. He sets up a little breakfast at the shore and says, Let's see. I'm gonna bring you back. I'm gonna restore you where you failed me. The valley of the shadow of death. And guess what? The showbread in the temple was on a table. And when we pray, give us our day or daily bread, that's what it was called, the daily. God showing up. When you think you're going to starve. Is there such thing as starving spiritually and emotionally? Psychologically? That you do things out of desperation? You become intense about certain things because this is it's what we eat is the true war. It's what we feed on. And God goes to war. Satan did this to Jesus in the wilderness. Turn these stones to bread. I'll feed you by my command. Go ahead. You're the son of God. You do it. Jesus was being led out to the wilderness to have a war with bread. What? You're starving, Jesus. You're desperate. I think God forsook you, buddy. How come he's not letting you eat for 40 days and 40 nights? I don't think he loves you like you think he does. I think he's abandoned you. How many people here have dealt with abandonment issues? Rejection issues? God forgot about me? God's overlooked me? And all of a sudden, you're handed the hand of the devil, and he's got a nice Swanson's turkey dinner for you. You're ready to eat. Is that cranberries? Is that a warm brownie in the little corner there? Man, it's that desperation. It's the real war is there. Who feeds you? What feeds you? God goes to war by feeding you. And it says that their garments never wore out, right? Their shoes never wore out. They were healthy. They had no diseases. And the idea we're just thinking about is just a health thing. But there's a mental, spiritual health, too. What, what is the diseases of Egypt? Is it just like, wow, they didn't have COVID? What is the disease of Egypt? What made them want to go back and eat the food of Egypt? That's right. They, they were in a very toxic relationship with Pharaoh. The more Pharaoh beat them up, the more they were desperate to get his approval. That was their manna. It was slave food. Marinated meat, flesh pots. Onions, garlic, watermelon, fish. Does that sound like slave food to you? Okay. Ham hocks. I mean, what do I got to... This is slave food. And we will say, but at least in Egypt, I got this. Because they knew you were going to get fed every day. Now transfer that to a toxic relationship. Hey, I might be miserable, but I get this crumb out of it. I get this little tiny thing out of it. Satan knows how to demoralize you and reduce you to a crust of bread. That is in the Proverbs. That is the manna thing. And so God is saying, I need to heal you from that. I got to bring you out to the wilderness and reorder numbers 
reorder your life. And you could depend on me. I'm a good shepherd. I set up a table in the presence of your enemy. I anoint your head with oil. I give you my presence. I bring you my spirit. If you want the Holy Spirit of God, follow him to the wilderness and let him reorder you. And guess what? You're going to come to terms. Even the word for masa is the word to test. The matzah balls. It's the word test. Try my heart. See if there be any wicked way in me. Matzah, matzah, matzah. That's the word matzah. God went out to the wilderness and he tested them. He matzahed them. What are you going to eat? When you're in this situation, what are you going to eat? And guess what? You get this weird view. Like when I was in the Navy and I had to go through Sears school. Well, you don't know it, but when you're out there and you're starving and you're being beat and you're being offered, if you're if you have allegiance to your captors, you get these benefits. They give you toothpaste. Oh, you know what toothpaste feels like when you haven't brushed your teeth in a in a week or so. Oh, oh, minty fresh too. That feels good. <laughs> They have a pile of chocolate chip cookies there, too. Oh, man, I haven't eaten in a week. Ah, chocolate chip cookies. You just want the beatings to stop. So people will be on the PA system confessing war crimes. Like, hey, have you guys forgot this is training? But you get in this weird Stockholm syndrome, right? You start, like, you know, wanting your captors to be nice to you. So you fall in love with them. Start having fantasies of being married to your kidnapper it's creepy huh but that is what satan does and so the temptation is to fall into this means of survival whatever i have to do to get on board with this narrative so i get the crumb thrown to me and god says we've got to deal with the internal process where you're ready to do that what are you really feeding on are you wanting to go back to egypt and get that diet where it says that God punished them because they were so miserable and matzah, the testing, they didn't want it anymore. They wanted no more matzah balls. <laughs> so God gave them the desires of their heart. You know, that's in Psalm 78. And it's all through. As I said, I'll give you guys the notes on this if you want. And what did he give them? Do you remember the Bible story? They wanted flesh. Well, what did they, God give them? You know, Zach, do you remember? Mm -hmm. What? Quail. quail. It's interesting. The word quail is very interesting. It's the idea of dense or fat. And they were low. Quail was so low. It says they're up to their knees in quail. They're just, it's the idea of getting something very easy, something that's very tangible to you. That's the word quail, by the way. It's the Hebrew word. Something that's just right there. Right there. You can just, there it is. Oh, it's available. Flesh. How close is your flesh to you? What's the book of Romans chapter seven says? How close your fresh is? Who will deliver me from this body of death? This voracious, psychopathic, desperate guy who's whispering in my ear. He's right here, right? In Rome, one of the punishment is, is that when you kill somebody, one of the punishment is, is what? You guys know what it is? That Paul was using as an illustration. They chain you to the guy you killed. You got to drag around that dead corpse. Like if you killed a homeless guy and you're like, he was nothing. He says, oh, really? He's nothing? Well, guess what? He's now chained to you. That rotting corpse is now your punishment. Oh, really? Uh, well, there you go. So it's this idea of maybe to learn your lesson, you need it real close to you. So it says that the quail was so abundant that it came out of their nostrils. Could you imagine like, like one time I remember, I'll never forget, I was eating applesauce and cottage cheese. My friend made me laugh and applesauce and cottage cheese came out of my nose yeah. on the kitchen table, man. That was rough business. I couldn't imagine quail. <laughs> but even this nostril thing is the word off. It's your emotions. Like to the point where their very existence, God breathed into their nostrils the breath of life. It is now your life. And God says, I made them absolutely and then the when the flesh was still in their mouth and they're chomping away my wrath came down upon them that's in the bible but i'll get all the notes i'll send you that <sighs> this is what you want well go for it do you boo boo do you 
Okay. <laughs> got shoveling. Hey, got, like chocolate ice cream here. The Hagadah truck. Boop, boop, boop. Open your mouth. <laughs> After a while, you're like, I never want to eat Hagen Dust again. You have visions of Hagen Dust. You're going, Boom! But what was God trying to do to them in the wilderness? You guys, this hunger, this feasting. So they want to go back. They don't want the tests anymore. And God says that in my wrath, I wanted them to enter into the rest. I wanted to get them into the promised land. But the problem was, they didn't want the matzah. They didn't want to be tested. They didn't like what they saw in the mirror. So they'd rather eat the delusional food of Egypt and have visions and dreams and sell themselves back up to be slaves again to just buy into the fantasy. In Egypt, they it was the it was the center of theater and entertainment. So they were sitting there thinking, man. We're in the wilderness and the new Johnny Depp movie came out. This is bunk. It's in the margins. And it's this idea that you're going back to things that you used to use. There was a song by, you ever heard of Super Tramp? Super Tramp had a song called uh, Rudy. Rudy's on the train to nowhere halfway down the line. And it says that he would go to the movies and he'd get out of the movies, numb from all the pain. But after a while, he'll soon be back on that train. I just want to just divert from this. I just need a break from this. I just need quail. I don't want to have to deal with this part of my... I don't have to look it in the mirror. It's too bitter. It's too painful. God says, hang in there with me. Cry to me and I will satisfy your soul. Through the valley of the shadow of death, I will set a table in the presence of your enemies. Your enemies is, we're our worst enemy, right? <laughs> Aren't we? I am. I am. My choices and what my cravenness is, what my lust, what my, what, and that's what he says. They're, they died by their own lusts. This is all in the notes. I'll send it all to you. It was their lusts that destroyed them all. And it says, he says, I swore in my wrath. It's the word for nostrils. Don't you know how much I love you guys? And you guys kept never trusting me, never letting me be the provider, never letting me feed you. You just fed what was close to your flesh. And that ruined you. You're feeding the beast. It was so bad that in the scriptures, you know how the promised land, the land of milk and honey, they started calling Egypt the land of milk and honey in the wilderness. Remember that? They started calling that the land of milk and honey. They totally reversed the whole thing. So on this, like, no, as I said, and we'll do kind of, we're going to probably part to this, go a little more deeper or something like that, because I really do want to get into the white stone. And I'll send you guys some, some of this so you guys can kind of read before we get started next time. But this white stone is this, we'll get into them next week. It was a really a stone of voting during an election. Right? Believe it or not, it's a rubbing stone. And it uh, means that to talk about, because when you get into the root word of it, I'll just kind of just touch on it real quick. It's the idea of um, the only time this stone is ever used. And since you were good at guessing last time, go to Acts chapter 26. We'll kind of wrap up our study on this. <clears throat> is Acts 26, verses 9 through 11. This is how we'll wrap it up. Isn't this fascinating? Yeah. <clears throat> verses 9 to 11. Think of 9-11. I <laughs> don't want to think about that. Acts 26. 1 6 1 8. Yeah, 1600. Yeah, it's all almost near the end. Right so, yeah. Yeah, there you go. This is good because this is how we're, we're learning how to get familiar with the Bible, everything else. With my use, I have endless Bible drills. What? 
chapter 26, verse 9. I can tell you that. Yeah, better, right? yeah, is that great? Uh, well, it's your swords. Yeah. I used to always tell my kids, Get, don't stay away from my Bible. It cuts you. <laughs> this is a well-sharpened sword. You guys have these blunt little wooden swords that are made of styrofoam. I'm not worried about your sword. You should worry about my sword. <laughs> Mine has been wetted by heaven and bathed in lightning. It's a two-edged sword. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's a scalpel. <laughs> Thoughts and motives now been revealed. Stay away. You don't want to. <laughs> you don't want to know what's in this book. All right, Acts twenty six verses nine through eleven. Indeed, I myself thought I must do many things contrary to the name of Jesus. This all this I also did in Jerusalem, and many of the saints I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And then when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. There it is. I cast my vote. That's the word, white stone, in Revelation 2. You are constantly making your decision and voting for one Lord over the next. You can't serve both, right? It says that you will love the one and hate the other, both God and what? Mammon? It's a form of manna. Mammon was who feeds you where do you get your nourishment from like like uh when you get a a, a, a test done on for breast cancer it's called a what yeah. now you know yeah. from the breasts what bosom are you feeding on either the bosom of the lord or the bosom of satan, satan. yeah baphomet <laughs> he's got his boob out yeah you're either being fed by one or the other, but you're not going to be fed by both. You're going to love the one and hate the other. Go ahead. I gave my vote against in verse 11. And I punished them often in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly enraged against them, I persecuted them to the foreign city. That is the intestines. That is the pathos. That is where Paul was at. He was feeding on this. He was, he was literally lusting after the Christians. He hated them. He was throwing them under the bus. He was pursuing them from city to city to city. That's his mammon. That was his manna. That was his food. He was feeding off of what? His hate. His anger. His rage. His, what's the word I'm looking for? The very fact that Paul was a team player. Paul was team player. Do you know who his uh, mentor was? It says in scripture. I studied from, do you know who? Zach, remember? Gamaliel. Gamaliel. If you read his writings, he was a super anti-Christian, hater of Christian. Gamaliel hated Christians. And he believed that your zeal against them is literally the proof of your love to God. So Paul says, I hated them with a pure, because I want the approval of who? Gamaliel. That was my guy. And I wanted to show how much I am a down disciple. I'm down for Gamaliel's school. I'm from Tarsus, Tarshish. I'm going hardcore. And so that was his manna. And in pursuing his manna, Jesus did what? Knocked him off his horse, blinded him, and says, dude, why are you going against my voice and persecuting my people? But God says, I'd rather have you hot or cold. I can't take the lukewarm, right? So that was Paul in desperate pursuit of manna. It was an all-out war. Last verses on this white stone, Luke 24, 39. There's only two other things, and that's how we're going to wrap it up. So I want you to find white stone again. Luke 24, verse 39. See if you could find the, uh, the manna, <laughs> the white stone. Twenty-four thirty-nine. Go ahead. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. 
Now go first John 1 1. Let's see if you could find the word. Behold my hands and my feet, that it is I myself handle me, see me, for a spirit has not flesh and bones, as you see that I have. First John 1 1. John? Yeah, first John. The epistles. Yeah. No, that's John. Oh, it's Must be, right? Is that go ahead, read it. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word. That's the word white stone. What? What's the handling? You're actually experiencing. You're experiencing it. You got your hands on this. You cannot have the white stone without following Jesus into the wilderness and having straight on hand to hand combat with this stuff. Straight handling, handle, touch, experience. Does this make sense? Yeah. That's how you're going to know me. It's the root word is where we get the word in the New Testament, a song. It's the word solo, 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 solo. It's to, to sing. To make melody. And a song in the scripture is an experience. A song of Moses. All these songs is what David went through. He followed God. And he went through these crazy experiences. The reason why I have crazy stories in Christianity isn't because I didn't follow Christ. It's because I followed him. There are people that criticize me for having such horrific experiences. Saying that I didn't pray enough. I wasn't devoted enough. I wasn't con The more I prayed, the more I consecrated, the more I devoted myself, the crazier things got. But guess what David learned about? Himself, what he fed upon, and him. Is God faithful? Is he merciful? Is he long-suffering? Is he patient? Is he, is he a God who sets up a mercy seat in the middle of a war zone and feeds me? Does he feed me when I failed him? Does he sit me down and say, David, lovest thou me? Feed my sheep. Feed me the way I just fed you. Feed my sheep, excuse me. Feed others the way I fed you. If I fed you in the wilderness, feed them. Right? Does this make sense? Yeah. Very powerful. In fact, when Jesus was being criticized when he wasn't being fed on Sabbath and he took the wheat together and he rubbed it in his hands, that's the word. It says he was rubbing it in his hands. And they were criticizing him. That's the word white stone, believe it or not. Are you ready for this? Very interesting. You guys heard of worry stones? Mm -hmm. What are worry stones? A pocket stone. A pocket stone the size of a fingernail. And the original ones were the color of fingernail. Bellium. Ah, here we go. These worry stones. And what would a worry stone do? I'm going to read from a website that sells worry stones. You guys ready for this? They are smooth, polished dem stones, usually in the shape of an oval of a thumb size indentation. Used for relaxation or anxiety relief, the smoothness of the stone is most often created naturally by the washing of water. What's the scripture say the word is? The washing of water. Worry stones made by seawater were generally used by the ancient Greeks. From the perspective of cognitive behavioral therapy, the use of worry stones is one of the many practices that can function as, as a psychological, healthy, self-soothing exercise. What is that white stone? The manna. As, you'll, as we'll go into part two in the next time, it's also the word for Laban or where we get frankincense. Christ is the white stone. He says, I'm the chief cornerstone. I'm the white stone. And the very fact that I'm at the right hand of God in heaven for you. White, perfect. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be. When you're worrying, don't forget, this is a well-worn stone, a tried stone, a tested stone, right? You'll see this in our next study. I read on. Such techniques are are um, in counseling are in, are implemented at the early stages of treatment, displacing many destructive coping mechanisms is to replace destructive coping mechanisms. The white stone. So that kind of like you know, give a, a 
alcoholics are clean. Right. Right. Or if you're having disassociative things, you snap the rubber band. Mm. But it's the idea of reminding you, wait a minute, you're in a triggered place. What is your true food? Where are you going to be getting your true emotional, spiritual food? Right? Is this fascinating? I'll keep reading. Destructive coping me mechanisms such as nail biting, scratching, lip biting, and then just add whatever you want to add. That the patient may have developed. This helps steady the patient to safely confront their fears, anxiety, and traumas. The white stone. Exactly. Jesus. Isn't that amazing? I mean, you guys are running all the parallels in your mind, right? In other words, it's the most purest form of essential medicine from the ancient times. The website says it. Rubbing a worry stone, listen to this, helps the mind to focus and to calm the mind. Calm down. God's got it. He's got it. He is still the same Lord. He fed you in the wilderness. He'll feed you again. He always hears the cries of his people. He'll not forsake you. He'll not leave you. Your parents might leave you. Your, the people you love the most may forsake you, but I will never forsake you and I'll never leave you, right? They learn that God is faithful. And this worry stone is used to put all of your problems into perspective. In the ancient courts of justice, the accused were condemned by black stones and they were acquitted by white stones. A vote on account of use of these pebbles for voting the white pebble was a well-worn, smooth stone by handling. By implication of the use of a counterbout, a, a verdict, an acquittal, or ticket, whatever, a vote, the white stone was also the word for a voice of a man advocating for you. Is Jesus not our advocate in heaven? For acquittal in a court proceeding. Acquittal of our suit. There we go. Does that make sense? The white stone. Don't forget that Jesus is defending you up there. How many things do we do based upon what are they called? Intrusive thoughts in counseling. What's intrusive thoughts? You're stupid. You're an idiot. No one loves you. Da, 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 right. All these thoughts telling you, you see, that's why no one can love you. That's why this, that's why that. And these powerful intrusive thoughts is the very manna that Satan is going to now feed you with. Black stone after black stone after black stone, right? Isn't that what the big mega corporation is now that's running the world called black stone? It's actually called black sure. stone. Yeah. Isn't this fascinating? And so that's the manna. They're going to feed you one desperate thing after that. It's going to appeal to your fears, to your insecurities, to everything that we've been doing privately is now going to be now collective and social. It's mostly all about fear. Fear, fear, fear. And here no is food. the food we're no handing you. Food. Here's the relief from it. Here's the temporary fix. Here's your flesh pot. Here's your garlic and your leeks. Here is your slave food. This is what's going to keep you in bondage. This is going to give you temporary satiation, satisfaction. And this is going to keep you stuck here in Egypt. Never go out to that wilderness again. Don't ever go out there again. Stay in comfy land. Pirates of the Caribbean part 29 is about to go out. Right? Fast and Furious 38 is just about to be released. Just, just, just what is next month? It's going to be Sonic the Hedgehog is going to be the driver. Beetlejuice 2. Beetlejuice 2 is his next one. Okay. Yeah. Is it, what is that? So what, what, what is really going on here, you guys? Where There's always going to be a reason in these very inferior things that we're getting. Because did you know that Rocky 98 is about to come out? Rambo. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Rambo and the Rambats. They're doing a can-can scene. <laughs> so what is it that's saying? He's always got something, you guys. It's always going to be some stupid reason. It's just a repeat of the same stupid thing. In fact, the quality gets worse and worse and worse, right? Back to the future 400. <laughs> 
Marty is a zombie and a vampire. No, I was going to say, you know, that's Bonnie. There we go. That would be a good one. See, well, that's okay. there's always some that. reason to stay yeah. in Egypt. You see what I'm trying to say? I, Don't go out to that wilderness. I would have used the time machine to go back to see Jesus. Don't go back. I mean, don't go out to that wilderness and learn and be tested and discover yourself and learn in a living, active way. That's the rubbing part. Touch me. Handle me. It's active. It's living. It's called the daily bread. We are daily. It says that the church met daily, that they prayed daily, that everything was being taken away from them. Do you know why? Because during the times, if you were a Christian, they took away all of your, the synagogues took away your rights. You couldn't even have a business. You had to sell your property. And do you know what the Christians did? Guess what? It's coming up soon. The community of Christians that are going to be, quote, pushed out of the system, we're going to have to help each other. If it's growing gardens or whatever it is, we're going to have to be helping each other. We're going to be off the grid at some point. It says you cannot buy nor sell if you're going to follow Jesus. And guess what? Satan's going to hand you Babel and say, but don't, you, don't worry about it. You don't have to go out to that wilderness to follow Jesus. Stay with us. Or you can't buy nor sell. If following Jesus is more important to you than anything else, you will be going through the daily bread. You will have to be touching and handling him daily. And you will grow. And you will develop. And you will, these diseases that are in our soul. And I'm not just talking about diagnosable things from a lab. I'm talking about deeper diseases, right? The disease of the soul. That's what Jesus is trying to get to the inner man. That's all in the study. When you get this whole idea, it's the inner man. Um, I won't read anymore. I'm so tempted because I know we should wrap it up. But the whole process that Paul was even talking about saying, God is using the manna to get to my inner man. That's part two. That's when Zach's in uh, Philippines. Or, yeah, well, I'll send those. The inner man is everything to God. How do I get to that voracious, starved, craven golem? Precious, all that weird kind of processing, right? Right, huh? Where he's like fighting inside, but it just takes him over at some point. You can't trust Gollum, can you? Yeah, he's made of the flesh, of man. He's the core nature of the human. And so this is this kind of lust, and God's trying to wean us from the Gollum, right? Does this make sense? Yeah. So the inner man is everything. And the hidden man of the white stone, the thing that we're in a hidden way feeding from, God says, I will give you a new name if you do that. You know what, Nebuchadnezzar? You need to be born again. You're not feeding on me. You don't. I'm not your bread. I'm not your sustenance. And in order for you to be, quote, my child, numbered amongst my people, go to the wilderness I'll put everything in order and I'll cleanse you and I will make you enter into my rest. Does that make sense? He swore in his wrath that they would enter. They would not enter into his rest. Why? Because they murmured against him. And you'll see on the next study what they called the manna. Do you know what they called the manna? Light and loathsome. There's no, there's nothing quality about this. We hate it. It's a curse to us. And God says, man, that really hurt me. Because guess what the manna represents? Him. Jesus says, bread. I'm the bread. I'm the manna. And I didn't satisfy you? And the fleshy man says, no, actually, I was really turned off by you. Dressed down as you are. When Jesus came, did he come all dressed up? Or did he dress down? He came all in white as if he's man in the wilderness. Do you want me? Well, you're uncomely. There's nothing in you that we should desire you. But if you eat of me, you thought Moses gave you the bread. Father in heaven has given you me. I'm the manna. Here I am. And guess what most people did? They walked away from him. And then he turns to his disciples and he says, you guys are going to leave me too? But what does Peter say? Praise God that Peter had the right response. What did he say? Where are we going to go for life? You're the only one that has a life. There's nowhere else to go. Ah, that's the rock, the man of the stone I'll build my church on. 
total dependence upon me. I am your life. Good one, Peter. Good answer. Amen? Amen. Mm-hmm. All right, let's have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, <clears throat> we all need to, when we talk about you and testify of you, that we are your witnesses, that we do that because we've handled you, we touched you. We realize that without you, we have nothing, we are nothing. I just ask, Lord, for the Holy Spirit to lead us and guide us into a genuine trust, no matter how difficult it might be to choose you over what uh, Satan hands us. But I plead, dear God, that we take what's handed by you, what is dispersed by you, what is dispensed by you. And I pray, dear God, that we will be made white and cleansed and purified. Our thoughts and our motives will be rearranged and ordered. That something very beautiful about yourself will be what we discover, that you are always faithful. You are uh, a great provider. Um, You don't leave us. You don't forsake us. You don't abandon. You said that where I am there, you may be also. You share everything that you have from your table. You invite us to your table. I pray, dear God, that every single person in the listening of this study will all eat of that manna and be at that table to dine with you on that day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, guys. And on that note, let's eat. <laughs>